Hey guys, I'm Justin Ball, and welcome back to The Recording Percussionist, where I show you everything you need to know to get from that beginning stage of looking at a microphone or camera for the very first time to that intermediate stage where you feel confident in your ability to set up, record, and edit an entire recording session all on your own. Throughout the series, we've discussed a lot of specifics regarding microphones, and you keep hearing me say that how you use them is more important than the quality of the gear itself. Today, I'll be showing you how to determine the best spot to put your instrument and where exactly your microphone or microphone should be placed to capture the best of your playing. So you want to figure out the best spot in the room to record. To be honest, this is kind of like gene tracking. You're going to get different results depending on the type of instrument, the frequency range of the instrument, the type of microphone or microphones, including but not limited to the distance, height, and angle of the microphones, the shape of the room, the size of the room, the materials the room is made of, the materials located in the room, and the placement of the instrument in that room. That being said, the best way to figure this out is by experimenting. Sure, there are clean cut standard recommendations for microphone placement, and we'll be discussing those in detail. But if you really want to learn how the microphones interact with the instrument, the best way to do this is by experimenting. Before deciding where in the room the instrument's going to sound best with the mics, you first have to determine where it's going to sound best with your ears. You can start by walking around the room and listening closely while clapping your hands. What you're listening for is a smooth, even reverb decay. If you hear a boingy sound like an echo, 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 you're going to hear that in your recording, and that's very bad. I'm good. Ask yourself, what kind of room are you recording in? What's it made out of? Is it fairly padded, or is there a lot of reflective material, like marble, granite, brick, tile, concrete, metal, or glass? While you may enjoy the reverb and brighter timbre these materials have to offer, the fact is that they change the sound of the instrument, making it harder for the microphones to get a pure reading. Don't let me steer you wrong though, these materials do have the ability to create some really incredible and natural reverb, but only if the room is big enough for the sound waves to disperse evenly. Remember that the speed of sound is fast, but finite. So you want the microphone to have enough room to capture the initial transients of the instrument, as well as the reverb after the fact. This is what makes rooms with higher ceilings ideal. If there's a spot where the ceiling is highest, test it out, see how it sounds. Do your best to stay away from corners and walls, especially when recording percussion instruments. Corners are going to cause what is known as bass loading, meaning that your lower frequencies are boosted to a level uncharacteristic of the instrument's natural sound. If you're close to a wall, it's going to affect the sound of your instrument depending on the material it's made out of. If it's a soft material, it's likely to absorb or take away sound. And if it's a reflective material, you get it. It's best to capture the sound of the instrument in the most natural and open environment possible. For this reason, the best spot to start in any room is the very center, where the sound waves will have the most room to disperse with no interruptions. One of the most fundamental things to understand when recording is how your instrument projects sound. I was emailing back and forth with Doug tomorrow, and he informed me that marimbas actually project omnidirectionally from the top of the tube. However, it's also important to find that sweet spot for the instrument to really sing. Sometimes this means moving the instrument, and sometimes it means moving the mics. Think about it, just because the marimba doesn't sound good in a certain spot, does that mean that the instrument is in the wrong spot? No, maybe you're in the wrong spot. This is exactly why I said it's like gene tracking. You have to spend time getting to know your instrument, space, microphones, and how they interact with one another. It can sound dull in one spot, then move it a foot or two in either direction, and it just screams. If you really want to get great sounding recordings, take the time to figure out where everything's going to sound great. Your future recordings and the people listening to you will thank you. As for microphone placement, there are also tons of different approaches you can take with this, which also depends on all the aforementioned elements of sound travel. If you're recording a solo keyboard instrument, such as a marimba, I find that setting up the mics about 8 to 10 feet out from the instrument and about 6 feet high works great for small diaphragm condensers, especially omnis, because they're picking up the natural reverb of the room. If you find that you're not getting enough articulation, you can try moving the mics closer or use a different type of microphone altogether, such as a cardioid condenser, which is more directional and will pick up more of the desired sound and less of the room. You can also use both. Try setting up a set of omnis 8 to 10 feet out and another set of cardioids up close. You may end up only using the sound from one set, which is perfectly okay and happens more often than you'd think. 
In case you're wondering, one set of microphones won't have any sort of negative effect on the other, and you'll have full control over how much sound is coming in, how it's panned, and getting the balance between them. For percussion ensemble recordings, there are a multitude of ways to approach this, and it all sort of depends on the gear and how many players you're recording. Sometimes you'll see recordings with mics on every single instrument in order to maximize the level of manipulation in post-production. However, some of the best percussion ensemble recordings I've ever heard were recorded with a single pair of omnidirectional condensers at the front of the ensemble. If you're not sure which approach is best for you, try both. It's better to have more options to choose from than less options, and setting up more microphones won't negatively affect anything, except maybe your sanity level. The only way to figure out which one works best for your space, instrumentation, and microphones is by setting all of them up and messing with the mix and post to find the perfect balance. While some people may think that setting up 100 microphones for one recording session only to use the sound from two of them is a waste of time and energy, I actually view that as a valuable learning experience. Try starting with a matched pair of small diaphragm condensers up front, and if you feel like you're not getting enough of a certain instrument in the ensemble, throw them a bone, spot mic them with a cardioid pattern mic up close and see if that helps. Schedule some time with your friends or maybe even your students to just get in there and mess around with this stuff. For those of you just getting started, I'd like to share a really cool approach with you that I've found to be super successful. First, I'll open up a Google Sheet and create rows for all of the microphones I have at my disposal, including height, distance from the instrument, the angle of the microphones, mic sensitivity, and any other parameters I want to experiment with. Next, I'll open up a session in Adobe Audition and simply follow the instructions I've created for myself in the sheet. For example, a matched pair of DPA omnidirectional condenser microphones spaced two feet apart, five feet out, six feet high, with my mic sensitivity around six out of 10. I'll record a short excerpt of something, throw down a marker, change one of the parameters, for example, moving the mics a little closer or raising them a little higher, and repeat this process as many different ways as I can. As I do this, I'm creating a library of sound samples for myself to check out later, which will help me determine which one sounds best. Repeat the same process with different mics, and spice it up by throwing in combinations of mics mentioned throughout this video. In post, create a whole new set of parameters and keep track of how you're panning and mixing them. Once I'm done, I'll export them as WAV files, upload them to Google Drive, copy and paste links to the Google Sheet, and create another column of checkboxes so that as I'm listening, I can keep track of the ones I really like and narrow my preference down. After one or two tries of this, not only will you have a better idea of what you want the recording to sound like, but how to get it to sound that way, and why it sounds the way it does. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you're learning as much as I am from this series, consider subscribing and check out the next video where we talk about mono versus stereo and stereo miking techniques. Until then, happy recording.